There's a lot to discuss when it comes to the Exorcist Believer. So I thought for the first time in a while, I will do a spoiler review as well. So this is my spoiler filled review of the Exorcist Believer. You have been warned. What's up, everybody? It's Nick at the Lost River Drive-In, and tonight I wanted to give you guys my spoiler review for The Exorcist Believer. This is a movie that where I'm, you know, there's a lot to talk about. Obviously, it's got the internet in a shitstorm right now, though not as bad as Halloween ends. So, good on you, horror community, for not being as toxic as it was with Halloween ends. But it's definitely got people in a tizzy, so I kind of wanted to break this down, give you my thoughts on what I liked and what I didn't like in detail as we go through the plot. The Exorcist is the greatest horror film of all time, in my opinion. I don't think anything will ever touch that movie. Although Halloween is my favorite, I do think it is the greatest horror film of all time. It is a landmark. It is, it's just a masterpiece in every sense of the word. So nothing I say about this movie positively or negatively takes away from the first movie at all. So having said that, the plot of The Exorcist Believer is basically two girls, Catherine and Angela, are, you know, their friends, they lie to their parents and say that they're going to study, you know, homework or whatever after school one day, when in reality, they're going out to the woods to try to talk to Angela's dead mom. And when they go missing and then show up three days later, things are very different with them. There are noticeable marks on them. There's noticeable behavioral changes. They essentially end up hospitalized. And Angela's father, played by Leslie Odom Jr., is not religious in any sense of the word. He, you know, his neighbor, played by Ann Dowd, she's kind of saying that she knows what this is and she's knows someone that's seen it before and he doesn't buy it. Eventually, he starts to believe it and he reaches out to Chris McNeil. Chris McNeil, played by Ellen Burstyn, she is back, comes to meet with him and to see the girls and basically see what she can offer in terms of answers and maybe help. Things happen there. We end up having a like dual uh, exorcism at the end of the movie in the third act, and that's basically how the movie goes. That's the plot in less vague terms. Breaking this down, this movie opens with a sequence that takes place in Haiti in 2010, and it is Leslie Odom Jr., Mr. Fielding, and his wife, and she is pregnant with Angela. She has this blessing. This ceremony takes place where they're almost saying like your baby is going to be protected, and uh, literally not even five minutes later, there's a really bad earthquake. And she ends up getting severely injured. And the doctors tell him, we can save her or the baby, but we can't save both. Jumps to present day, Angela's 13 and her mom is dead. Uh, obviously, her and her dad have a really good relationship. That was something that was really nice to see. They are very close. And that gets brought up later in the movie. And I think it actually plays an important role in this movie. They understand each other. They respect each other. They care about each other. And their chemistry is really good. It really does seem like a real like father-daughter. Uh, it doesn't seem forced at all. I really genuinely enjoyed them on screen. She is clearly a little more sheltered. She doesn't really go out and do things. Uh, and being so close with her dad, he does feel like he can trust her, but he's also super overprotective. And I think a lot of that has to do with what happened to her mom. He you know, obviously doesn't want to lose her too. But he does begrudgingly agree to allow her to hang out with Catherine after school to quote-unquote study. Well, they go out to the woods and uh, they want to talk to her dead mom. It's something that she has never really done. She didn't know her mom. And uh, the next thing we know, they're missing. The parents are freaking out and Leslie Odom Jr. and Catherine's parents are really going at it. And it's interesting because it's nice to see the... Uh, it's Catherine's dad is kind of an asshole. And it's nice to have uh, Mr. Fielding call out his relationship with his daughter and say like, well, my daughter's close. I know she's not hiding anything from me, but do you know your kid basically? And it starts this whole thing. And that kind of carries on throughout the movie. It's two different parenting styles. And I think it matters. I really do. And I think the movie shows that it matters. But when they show back up, obviously you get your prototypical possession movie stuff you know oh i've got these marks we've you know we're saying these weird things we are we're acting these weird ways all of that is kind of like prototypical possession stuff we've seen it before but when chris mcneil comes in the picture i've just got to give a shout out i think that ellen burston does a really really nice job this is a woman that is over 90 years old and i have to correct myself i said she was in her late 80s no she is older than that and she can still command a screen and she can still deliver a line and it be believable. It did not seem like she was phoning it in at all. 
there was real pain behind it. And it's just, it's nice to see Ellen Burstyn return to the character that meant a lot for her career and for her personally. So it was, it was awesome. And I think that her and Leslie Odom Jr. have really good presence together on screen. I think that their conversations are, are nice. And uh, I, I liked her story. I liked that Reagan never forgave her after she wrote a book and has completely cut off communication with her. And I also liked that Chris ended up finding purpose almost in trying to help parents that go through something similar, trying to help these kids. So it makes it believable when she wants to help his kid and Catherine. And uh, the movie does get a little bit weird here and it makes a decision that is something that I don't know if I necessarily would have done. But before we get there, let's just unpack that entire first act. The first act, I think, of this movie is the best part of this movie. Like I said, you actually really do get to like these characters and get to know these characters. You get, obviously, more of Mr. Fielding and Angela's relationship, but you do get to like these characters. Catherine and Angela seem like sweet kids. They're just normal middle school kids. They kind of, you know, they're kind of wanting to explore a little bit and I don't know try to uh, experiment with the dangerous uh, you know we all did that when we were 13 14 years old or we all thought about it so you really like them you like their chemistry um, you are immediately drawn in by I think the movie is really well shot I think it's photographed really nicely it has this uh, there are a lot of shots that harken back to the original exorcist especially aerial shots which I really appreciated and I think that the atmosphere here is good too. Definitely feels like a fall watch, an October watch. You know, the leaves, it's very cold. Um, I love it. Color palette, all of that's great. I've, I've said it a million times. David Gordon Green can direct a scene. He can, he can photograph film like he just can. Writing sometimes isn't always the strong suit. And I think that's because there's too many cooks in the kitchen. But he really can direct. He can direct his ass off. So the first act of this movie is awesome. Like, I think it's actually really good. I was sitting in the theater and I was like, this is good. Like, this is focusing on the drama, like the original movie. Like, I really liked it. The second act is when things start to get a little wonky because you have Chris introduced and I like that. But it's after Chris, it's when Chris and Mr. Fielding go to find Catherine. It's when it's kind of like, okay. I like the scene when Chris conf confronts Catherine. I do like that. I do like some of the lines that are, you know, exchanged between the two of them. And I do love that she name drops Reagan. And I do, I think that she's very powerful in this. You know, for a woman in her 90s, it probably wasn't easy to deliver some of these lines with such gusto. I think she did a really good job. But Catherine's possessed self stabs Chris in the eyes with a crucifix and blinds her. And I knew this was coming. I had already known that this was going to happen in this movie. So I wasn't surprised by it. But watching it happen, I didn't know how it really sat with me. I was kind of like, wow, uh, they really just did that. Whew, I, I don't know if I would have done that. That is a bold decision, David Gordon Green. Uh, I will say, I loved right after it, that the demon inside of Catherine echoes the line from the first movie about your cunting daughter. I, I, that was, that was kind of, it was a nice callback. I, I did like that. Um, obviously there's this antagonistic relationship there because the demon obviously knows that Chris and Reagan are not speaking and knows that their relationship is fractured. So I liked all of that. She gets taken to the hospital and, uh, she didn't die, but she's now blind. She has lost her sight. And, uh, it plays a little bit later in the movie. I think it makes a little more sense. You know, there's a scene where she's talking about belief and she's talking about, you know, believing in things you can't see almost and, uh, kind of expanding your worldview. And I think that... <laughs> It is very poignant. It's a poignant point to make, but wow, David Gordon Green, to do that so literally by blinding her with a crucifix was like, I mean, <laughs> you're laying it on a little thick there. I, I don't know if I would have done that, but it was definitely a choice. So uh, from that point forward, once they start to believe and once they really start, it, mainly her father starts to believe, they get their closest friends and allies together and they're like we're gonna do this we're going to perform this exorcism and uh the the pastor or the father i guess i should say he's a priest um because there is a pastor but the priest that is going to perform the exorcism cannot get the okay from the church they he's trying to they're not sure if he's going to get it and when the night comes for them to do this dual exorcism he shows up and pussies out basically says the church didn't approve it and Dowd's character is talking about how, like, dude, you and I both know what this is. Are you really going to leave these little girls hanging? Like, what are we supposed to do? 
And so they go and fight it alone. Um, and uh, I like the exorcism stuff for the most part. Uh, there are some moments that are like, wow, typical exorcism stuff. Like there's floating in the air and there's this black CGI vomit. And it's like, that's what I said when I said in my tweet that there was some of your like typical eye rolling possession horror stuff. That's some of the stuff I was talking about where it's like, we have seen that done to death in these possession movies. I didn't need that. Like I just... I don't need you to do the things that I'm going to see in literally every Possession movie I watch. But there were some also cool things in this, in this third act, where the priest does come back in to seemingly save the day and gets his head turned around, broken like Reagan did the head spin in the original. And I was like, okay, that's, wow, all right. And um, then you get the twist of this movie. And uh, I actually thought this played really well. The twist of this movie, God Playing a Trick on You, as you heard in the trailer, uh, is about how Angela was not chosen to survive. It shows more of the flashback from 2010, and he says to save his wife. And she ends up dying, and they're able to save Angela. And it is this really, like, the demon is fucking with him and saying, like, you didn't want her. You didn't want me. You didn't want me born. And uh, it's really powerful stuff, honestly, because it, it definitely speaks to, like, I, their connection. You know, we're told this entire time that they're really close and he loves her so much and it's a really strong relationship. And that kind of throws a wrench in a little bit. You're like, really, though? You didn't want her. And that played earlier in the movie. There was a moment with Anne Dowd where she confronts Angela and the demon that's in her and something she never told anybody, that she had an abortion right before she was about to take her uh, vows to be a nun. And the demon knew that. And uh, that was pretty interesting because it was like this. Obviously, that is a that's a hallmark. You have to have these demons mess with people like they have to try to get into your head. That's the whole point. And uh, so it was an interesting moment. But you really do see Mr. Fielding be like, no, nah, like I, I, he starts to believe he starts to have conviction. He's he is fighting for his daughter and uh, he goes and gets the scarf and uh, the demon is basically toying with him and saying, you guys can choose one of us. Just like you had a choice before, I'll let you choose. And the parents are like, we can't choose. But of course, Catherine's dad, who's a pussy and is hiding off in another room because he can't handle what's going on, when he's worried that it's just not going well, he says, I choose Catherine. So immediately, you think, wow, wow. This is, oh my God, like this asshole. Like, you just sentence another girl to death. And uh, it, they honestly trick you too. The demon tricks you. And uh, Catherine like comes to and she's fine. And Angela seems dead. And then, nope, role reversal. Catherine dies and Angela is back. The demon was toying with them. It was almost like he knew that someone was going to surrender to their bad impulses. And that person would have to pay. And honestly, I'm not mad at that. I'm not mad at that at all. And then, you know, we get this reunion and life is turning back to normal and Chris is recovering in the hospital and uh, someone comes in the room and she says, Victor, is that you? And it is Linda Blair as uh, Reagan McNeil. And she says, no, mom, it's me. It's Reagan. Um, and they hug and it's an awesome moment. It really, really is. And the movie ends. So that was a really in-depth uh, plot and like analysis uh, going by acts of the movie, giving you my opinions on some things and that. And now I just kind of want to do overall. So things that I liked about this movie, now that I can talk about it in depth, with this movie, like I said in the first act, getting to know these characters, liking them, the performances in this movie are all around really strong. I particularly like Ann Dowd, Leslie Odom Jr. I like Lydia Jewett, who played Angela. I, I really like the performances in this movie. I think it's really, really good. All of them across the board. Uh, I think the movie is photographed well. I said that earlier. I think there are some scenes in here. There are moments that David Gordon Green really shows some of his like his technique and I think his ability to direct better than a lot of people. Whether it's like there's these jump cuts and these flashes of like creepy imagery or whether it's, like I said, some of these aerial shots, some of the way the camera will sit still and like just look upon something. There's a lot of things like that. He, he's really good with the camera. I think this movie is very well photographed. I think that the Ellen Burstyn stuff, I love that she's in the movie. I love to see her return to the role. I don't know if I would have gouged her eyes out. I'm just going to be totally honest. Uh, I still don't know how I feel about that. Uh, like I said, I know it ends up playing a bit better at the end of the movie. And, and it's very, like I don't know, symbolic, but a little too on the nose for me. I just don't know if I would have done it. 
Uh, I'm glad she lived, but now she's blind, you know? Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll see more of her in the next movie, but I digress. That's more of a mixed thing for me. Um, I did love, absolutely loved, the uh, the God played a trick on you moment, and the choosing, and then the demon lying again, playing another trick. Whoever you choose is going to be the one that dies. But honestly, I felt like it was warranted. I really, really do. Um, he was really close with his daughter. He had really started to believe. He did really care. He did really feel remorse. And even through all of that, he wouldn't choose her over the other family's daughter. But they would. Um, so they, you know, almost kind of deserve that in the demon's own way of thinking. Which, you know, I can't say. I, I In that situation, if one of them's going to die, I can't say I don't understand that. I, I really do. And uh, I do think that the movie didn't play it safe. You know, I, I like that. I really do. That's one of them died. One of the kids died. Uh, and that's that's a tough pill to swallow. But I do think that it added some weight to this movie that might not have been there otherwise. Some of the complaints I have with the movie, like I said, guys, some of your hokey, like, run-of-the-mill possession horror stuff, there's still some of that in here. There really is. And some of it is, it kind of, it's eye-rolling. Like, it just is. I've seen it done to death. I do not need it. Um, the pacing in the second act is kind of, it's almost too fast at times. We go from, you know, here to here like this with, sometimes you're like, whoa, there was like really no development there. Like, where did all the development and character work that we were getting in the first act go? Uh, and I think that it was David Gordon Green falling victim to the impulse of wanting to get to the third act and really ratchet things up. And I guess I can understand that, but it makes the second act of this movie suffer. I think also that there are some just obvious attempts at jump scares that we've seen a million times. And uh, I will say, I don't think they're overdone in this movie. I really don't. And one of them did get me. Uh, lifting up a rock where a snake is there, uh, it, it made me jump. Like, I'm not going to lie. It, it got me. And that was like old religious imagery too. So that was really cool. It was an effective way to do that. And uh, it, it got me. Um, there's some stuff in the third act too that's just, I, I don't know how I feel about it. I really don't. I, I, I would say it's probably more negative and some of that. I do think it it dragged a little bit near the end there. I, I definitely do. Uh, I think, like I said, the CGI throw up, the floating of the bodies, some of just the contortions that the girls make. It's all stuff I've seen before. I didn't feel like, whereas in the first half of the movie, I felt like David Gordon Green was really telling his Exorcist movie. I felt like in the second half at times, he was really just telling a retread possession movie. Now, that's not to say that there's not highlights. There really are. And uh, I I love some of the lines that the you know the demon has. And I got to give credit to the script writers. I thought it was going to be cringeworthy. And it really wasn't. There's some good lines in there. But uh, yeah, the third act as a whole, there's just a lot of been there, done that, seen it, done better. Um, and it, it, it drags the movie down. It absolutely does. Um, I do have to say, uh, like a lot of people were saying at the test screenings, I have to agree, it's not very scary. It's just really not very scary. Uh, I do have to give credit. There is a moment in the movie, I did say there's a jump scare that got me. There is also a moment in the movie right after Angela gets home where uh, Mr. Fielding is talking to her at her bedside and we see her face and then the camera turns back to him and there's something blurry in the background talking and it's like this disembodied voice and it's so subtle and it's not a jump scare. There's no music cue, nothing. It's not like a bow, like it's not trying to get you. It worked. Like it worked. I was like, oh, damn. Like that's, oh, what is that? David should have done more of that. Um, that subtle, that, that subtle scare there worked so much better for me than any of the jump scares that they attempted in this movie. Any of the run of the mill possession horror stuff in this movie. He should have done that more. And if he is doing the sequel, I hope he takes that criticism to heart and leans more into that periphery type scare. To like I, that is so effective. There's a lot of that in the original Exorcist, believe it or not. And so, I mean, yeah, there's the way the movie ends off. It, it seems like it's pretty open and shut, uh, at least for the Fielding family. But it's not for Reagan and Chris. And I think that that is intentional. I, I will say this, guys. I do know for a fact, I can tell you that uh, Linda Blair has already agreed to be the, you know, one of the focal points of The Exorcist Deceiver. She is going to be a main character in that movie. 
they kind of had always intended that. Uh, and uh, when she came out publicly and was upset that she wasn't in Believer, they added that end there to kind of bridge it into the next movie. So, uh, but she is definitely going to be a focal point in the next movie. And I think that's good. It's another complaint I have about this movie that I feel like the movie could have been a little more focused and had a little more emotional weight if Reagan was more of a part of it. Uh, not to say that the Fielding family story wasn't good, because it is. But I think Reagan would have just added a little more gusto, a little more gravitas. And uh, so I'm excited to know she is heavily in their plans for Deceiver. That's, that's really nice to hear. You know, I've seen a lot of takes online about this movie. In summation, guys, uh, I, the critics were really railing against this movie. And I think the general sentiment I've got from most of the fan base has been, it was fine. Uh, or it was eh. And, you know, obviously it could be worse. But, man, from what some of the critics were telling you and, and what some of the trailers honestly might have shown you, you thought this was going to be an absolute train wreck. And there are a couple of people that think it was. But most people are like, eh, whatever. It was fine. It happened. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't egregious. And um, that's kind of where I land with it. Uh, a, a slightly more positive than that. Because I really did like the first half of this movie quite a bit. I give this movie three out of five stars. I think that's very fair. Slightly above average. There's enough really good in the first half of the movie. And there's enough of uh, s surprises in the third act. And, and things that are risky. That I say, you know what? You tried. And, and you mostly succeeded or passed the smell test. Uh, so a three out of five, I, th I feel like is fair. You know, there's a lot about this movie that's being said that I, I genuinely just can't get behind. I really can't. You know, some of the critics saying that this is, um, you know, just shitting on David Gordon Green. Like, guys, as a fandom, as a whole, like that's got, that just has to end. Uh, it really does have to end. If you If you have problems with some of the scripts, if you have problems with, Maybe he, what he does to a legacy character here and there. or You know, I, I get all that. But stop calling this man a hack that can't direct. It's just not true. Like, it is absolutely not true. Even before his foray into horror, he had some great movies. Stronger is a great movie. I recommend it if you haven't seen it. It's, it really is. Pineapple Express is one of my favorite comedies of all time. It's a great movie. Watch it if you haven't seen it. He's a good director. I think sometimes he gets a little bit too overzealous and wants to have his hand in every part of it. And, and I think a lot of directors are that way nowadays. And I kind of miss the good old days where a director was just the director and a writer was the writer. And I feel like if David stepped back a little bit and just allowed himself to just be the director, he wouldn't catch as much shit. But when you're involved in the story and you're involved in some of these decision-making processes, you know, I get it why people are like, yeah, but see... You piss me off with that one. So I get it. It's it's a mixed bag for a lot of people. But like seriously, David Gordon Green hasn't ruined any franchise. David Gordon Green hasn't erased anything from your memory or off of your movie shelves. David Gordon Green has, for better or worse, taken some wild swings at some classic IP. And I know that some people I've also seen say, well, he should stick to original ideas. Stop trying to resurrect, you know, classic IP. And I guess for the most part, I understand why people say that. But guys, that's not necessarily his choice. Like, yeah, he wanted to do Halloween. But I guarantee you, after they liked him and Danny's pitch for Halloween, that was Blumhouse and Universal going, do the next two as well. And then after that, Blumhouse and Universal going, will you do The Exorcist? I, and I feel like he had, it, it has to be said, guys, James Wan did this. You do horror... And you do what a studio mandates sometimes or what they would like you to do because you're trying to flex your creative muscle but also trying to really build up your own brand so you can get a studio to give you $100 million to make your own original, incredible, you know, masterpiece of a film that you have in your mind. So David, it's almost like he's shoveling the shit. And, and I don't mean to say that in a bad way because I like more of his movies than I don't. But in the public's arena, in their opinion, like, I don't think a lot of this is him going, I really just need to do legacy sequels. No, I, I think it's being asked of him. And I think he's also trying to build himself up as a more serious horror director. So, I mean, leave the guy alone. Like, if you don't like the movie, you don't like the movie. But, like, some of the things being said about him are just not true. Like, they are factually incorrect. And I, I it's so exhausting arguing about it. But anyway, guys, those are my thoughts on The Exorcist Believer. Those are my spoiler thoughts, breaking down the acts of the movie, what I liked, what I didn't like, and what I was mixed on. I want to hear down below what you guys thought. I haven't done one of these long-running 
free form videos in a while. I'm actually surprised and impressed that I only cut like twice uh, and would go like 10 minutes at a time just talking. Uh, it's kind of my strong suit. I don't need to write a script or anything. I can just talk. Uh, it's a gift and a curse. But I want to hear what you guys thought down below in depth now that we can talk about spoilers openly and freely. Please let me know. Leave a like on this video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And this is Nick at the Lost River Drive-In, and I am pulling out.